can go ahead and be seated. While you're doing that, turn to First Kings. First Kings chapter number 18. We'll talk to you about character and our sleep habits. I know it's going to get home for a while. It's going to call if you look up on it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> the proper amount of sleep is essential uh, for what you do as a person and a Christian. How little sleep you get has something to do with it also. So we have to learn that sleep habits, believe it or not, is not something that just naturally comes. Again, how do you form a good habit? You consciously, on purpose, do something over and over. I can't tell you how many older people. So when I hear about this, I keep thinking, okay, I'm headed that direction. What does that mean to me? Uh, they say they can't, they cannot stay awake. In the daytime, they stay awake all night long because they can't sleep. Uh, in my estimation, I don't know what other physical problems they're running into, but I think what's happening, if I'm not mistaken, they have no purpose to need to go to bed. So they go and they get tired. Well, after several weeks, you get tired later. Why? Because you slept in all that morning until 10, 11 o'clock, and now you can stay up even later. Now, what you think is, is that your uh, sleep um, necessities have changed. You can't figure it out when actually you worked a habit. You slept in a little more, slept in a little more, slept in, stayed up a little later. So you're forming a habit, a habit. Now you say, I guess it's just me. No, it's not just you. So I want to talk to you about that tonight. Character and our sleep habits. Look what happened in First Kings chapter 18. And uh, we're just going to skip through this a little bit. A Christian must not, keyword, foolishly, foolishly starve his body for sleep. Foolishly. Uh, sometimes you just need to take a break and get some sleep. I said foolishly, you need to understand this. Now look, if you would, please, here. We're going to look at how long Elijah stayed up. You ever wondered why he ran from Jezebel? Now, there's probably a lot of reasons why. I think this might be one of them. Look at chapter number 18, verse number 26. Are you there? Chapter 18, verse number 26. First Kings, chapter 18, verse number 26. And he took the bullock, which, uh, which was given them, and they dressed it, and they called upon the name of Baal from morning until the, the noon, saying. So right off the bat, we find, come to find out, from morning until noon, he would already put in a long day already. So sometime in the morning, he's watching all these people. He mocks them. He's watching them. He stayed up with them. He said, yeah, but it's only until noon. We're not done with the day here yet. Look at verse number 27 in the same chapter. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and cried aloud and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god, small g. Either he is talking, so now he's poking fun, he's quick-witted, a lot of things are going on, he's using up himself, and now it's getting past noontime. Drop down to verse number 29. And it came to pass at mid, when midday was past that he prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening. Now we're going up into the evening. So now started in the morning. He's put in a full day already. And we come to find out in verse uh, number uh, 30 through 35, now it's his turn. Here's what he does. You can read that yourself. He goes there, and all of this stuff is broken down. And come to find out he has to get the altar. He's got to build an altar. On top of that, then he has to get the wood. He has to put it in the right place. On top of that, he has to slay an animal. I have no idea. A lot of work. Hang up. A lot of work. And uh, they laid on the altar. Not only that, you read the story. They dug a ditch all the way around the altar, all the way around where the sacrifice, so that they could pour water in that. Then they had to pour water in it. It's a long day so far. He's put a lot of it in, and before the sun goes down, he's trying to get all this done. So now we come to find out, and by the way, in verse number 39 through 40, when he finally shows them, he, pre- he, 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 he prays 63, 65 words, fire comes down, melts and burns up everything, and then he told them, remember what he said, if God be God, let's serve him. If they'll be God, we'll serve him. Well, God was God. He's the one that answered. And so guess what happened? Now he's got to organize and get all 850, 450 uh, prophets of Baal, 400 uh, prophets of the grove. He gets them all together. Now, 
I'm just going to take a lucky guess that swinging to chop off people's heads, 850 of them, is going to take it out of you. Whether he enjoyed it or didn't enjoy it, that's a lot of work. So now we've put in a long, long day. Now we come to find out, drop down to verse number 41. Verse number 41. What's what it says? And Elijah said unto Ahab, now Ahab was still up there, Elijah was still up there, and we are talking about some rain starting to come. Now you have to understand here, he said, get up, uh, get thee up, eat and drink for the sound of abundance of rain. You remember when he said his servant, he didn't see anything for the first six tribes. Seventh try, he saw, he saw a cloud about the size of a man's hand. Yeah, rain's coming, it's warm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nobody in this room would suggest that. But he goes, watch what he is. So Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel, and he cast himself down. So he's here with this servant of his. Verse number 43, the last part, go again seven times. So he does. Now I want you to drop all the way down to verse number 46. And the hand of the Lord, uh, 45, and it came to pass in the meantime that the heavens was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. Watch verse 46. And the hand of the Lord, now we think because the hand of the Lord was on it, that means he didn't feel anything. It's kind of floating through the air, nothing bothered him. This guy ran a marathon. He just ran a marathon. And you come to find out that he ran from Jezreel, uh, from, from the top of Mount Carmel, down to Jezreel, and, the end, and he outrun Ahab, and he was in a chariot. So Jezebel, on the very next day, go to chapter 19, verse 1 and 2, Jezebel makes a threat. Ahab finally gets back home. He's pouting like a little kid. And she asks him what's going on. Oh, they've killed all the prophets. She hits the roof. And so she sends out an immediate uh, letter, phone call, something. You know, got him online, texted him, did something, and said, you want to be like, well, you know all those guys you just killed? You want to be that way tomorrow. For some reason, he decides to take off running. Now, the, all of these feats, all these miracles, all these wonderful works he just did, you get a letter from a woman. And you take, why would a man do that? Now all the women are going, yes, I know. Uh, but watch what happens here again. Why did Elijah run? Look, look at chapter 13, verse number 3 and 4. And when he saw that, talking about the letters he sent, or got word to him, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which uh, belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there, verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and he goes on from there. Please understand, all this has been going. He's been up for three or four days now. Up for three or four days. Don't know if he had any sleep, anything to eat. Now, he's been up there. He's ran 20 miles in front of Ahab to get down to Jezreel before he got there. He traveled uh, hurriedly from Jezreel to Beersheba, which if I, my calculations are right, they may not be. I think it's some 80-some miles. So he's traveling out away from everything to get away from this woman. Then we come to find out that he traveled on foot another day's journey in verse 4 of chapter 19. But verse 4, but he himself on another day's journey. If I understand the Bible, uh, a day's journey was considered to be somewhere around 10 to 20 miles. That's a day's journey. And so he did, he did that also. Elijah was exhausted. Now whether the Lord was in this or not, I'm not even going to try to guess. But I don't find out where the Lord said, you need to get out of here. You need to run. You need to go to a place and hide in a kid. I don't read that. So I'm assuming Elijah, it made sense to him to take it upon himself to get on the, on, on, to take off running, to get out of here. After he had already had these big days going on all the time. So what happens here, he's exhausted. Listen, when you're exhausted physically, most people are exhausted emotionally and mentally. When that happens, normally we're exhausted spiritually. It shouldn't be this way, but most of us, when our physical life goes down, our spiritual life goes down. It just seems that one pulls on the other. And so he was completely worn out, and his body was just flat starving for rest. He just needed a night or two of real good rest, and he might have been okay. Vince Lombardi, who used to be the uh, uh, coach of the Packers, said this one time, weariness makes cowards of us all. When we get tired, uh, it is proven when I worked at Rockwell, they were making us work 12-hour shifts 
seven days a week. Statistically, when they take all the statistics and manpower and how effective you are, anything, actually anything past six hours, productivity starts to fall off. Eight hours, it starts to really fall. Anything past that, you're almost becoming counterproductive. But what else are we supposed to do? So thank the guy who invented the light bulb, that would work around the clock. And the Bible said we're supposed to work through the day. Boy, if these weren't here, we'd all be at home right now resting. He said, be at home watching TV. No, one day you're like So he couldn't do that. So what happens is God steps in in Elijah's life, and God knows what he needs. And God knows what he's lacking. And so God very kindly comes along and helps Elijah get the nourishment and the sleep that he's been starving for. Whether he did it or God said it's time to go, he was lacking a lot of sleep and a lot of nourishment, which is what a lot of Christians do. So we find out, go to chapter 19, verse number 5 through verse number 8. Now he's way out in the desert. He's away from everybody. I mean, he's miles and miles. He's been on the run. He finally falls down, goes to sleep. And as he laid, and as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel, I'm in verse 5, touched him and said, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water by his hand. And he did eat and drink and lay down again. This guy's worn out. There's an angel here, and he's going to go back to sleep. Why does that shock people in the Bible? I'll never know. Remember when Peter was at the door talking? And uh, one of the women came out and said, It's Peter. He runs back in. She runs back in, tells the disciples, It's not Peter, it's probably just one of his angels. Uh, Whether it's Peter or not, I won't go see that. But they didn't. Peter's keeping knocking on the door. So watch what happens here. And verse number, he laid down again, verse 7. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great. Now he's getting ready to travel again. By the way, I don't understand this. With that little bit of food, he said, this is going to have to sustain for a month. That amazing. So watch what happens here. God knew how much rest that Elijah had done without. By the way, God knows anything about you. He knows how much rest you need. He knows how much foolishness that we rest too long sometimes. So number one, a Christian must not foolishly starve his body for rest. Number two, a Christian must not perceive, be perceived as a sleeper. When people start doing this, oh, they sleep in all the time. Oh, you can't get them out of bed. Yeah, that's me. That's not good. That's not a good. I'll show you somebody in the Bible. Go to Jonah. Remember Jonah? We talked about him the other day. Go to Jonah. You remember what they what they said about him? Right around here, Miss Hosea. You imagine if this is one big scroll. No chapters, no verses, no page numbers. Yeah, I think it's about halfway through the scroll. About three quarters of the way down on this line somewhere. I have to find it. That's what they had to do. And yet the Bible said, study to show thyself approved unto God, work and make not be ashamed. That was back before you had a Bible like this. So watch what happens here. In Jonah chapter number one, look at verse number six. And the shipmaster came to him and said, What meanest thou? Oh, boy. This, this doesn't sound good to me. What meanest thou, old sleeper? Jonah was on the run in disobedience to God. On the run in disobedience. Emotionally and mentally and spiritually and physically, this man was exhausted. In the middle of a storm that's about ready to break a ship apart, he's sleeping. That's exhaustion. This man was absolutely worn out. In verse number six, while everyone else is working, the heathen man, the boss, comes to him and says, What are you doing? A heathen looked at a Christian who said, I work for the Lord. I'm a Hebrew. He tells him the whole nine yards, and he says, What are you doing sleeping? Now, that's bad when everybody's working and everybody's at it and everybody's trying their best to do it, and you're sleeping. That's not a good thing. So he said, O sleeper, arise, call upon thy God, and so be that God will think upon us that we, look, we need your help. We pray to all of our gods, and I'm going to get you, you pray to the God, go pray to him. We need your help. What are you doing sleeping at a time like that? It just wasn't a good situation. Sleeping and resting at the wrong time. Everybody's working. 
Everybody's also worn out. They're all worn out. I mean, it's been days they've been making at this. He's downstairs sleeping somewhere. So we thought that is no time to be sleeping. So number one, a Christian must not foolishly starve his body for sleep. I said foolishly. I'll just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. Somebody's got to do it. I'll just keep putting this. Sometimes that can be very foolish. Number two, a Christian must not be perceived as a sleeper. You know those cute little nicknames everybody grins about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's them. It's not good. Okay? Now, if you have a, a, a cool little nickname like, you know, what a great Christian. That'd be okay. okay. Number three, a Christian must not sleep to avoid conviction. This happens in churches all the time. Jesus slept when he did. By the way, remember Jesus slept on a boat in the middle of a storm? Do you know why? He was in the middle of God's will. He wasn't concerned about the storm. Not Jonah. Come find out Jonah slept as a way to get away from the conviction of God because he knew he wasn't doing what was right. Christians do this all the time. When a person is very uh, depressed, sorrowful, you know what we like to do a lot? Sleep. And by the way, most of it didn't help a bit. They get up just as worn out and as tired. You know why? Because you're not in the will of God. Jesus got up, took care of business, and went on with life. Just like, oh, yeah, this is cool. Okay, fellas, here, let me take care of things. Peace, be still. Wait, wait, calm down. Wind, that's enough. He goes right on with life. Why? He was in the will of God. Jonah was not in the will of God. Let me ask you a question here. Are you sleeping in order to avoid some responsibility that God has given you? Why do you sleep so much? Now, it is a dead fact that for all you old people, look at me with tears in your eyes. Now, you say, as you get older, this whole thing about older people can get by with two or three hours a night, that's, that's a lot. But you better be careful about sleeping your life away. Now, here, that's what we're talking about here now is about conviction. During the, during the preaching on Sunday, by the way, you see this in teenagers all the time. Teenagers do it all the time. Man, they're up and they're, they're giggling, laughing, running through the aisles, pushing people down and eating food and all that. Preaching comes on. And you think to yourself, why did they do that? Well, first of all, their sleeping habits are terrible. Yeah. On top of all of that, you think the devil, their flesh, and the world actually wants them under conviction of truth? So guess what we do? Look, folks, training yourself to stay awake when you're really tired is a character problem. It's a trained habit. How is it somebody your age or older how is it somebody that put in as much time as you could stay awake and you can't watch it? You watch, here's our shoes. I guess they just can't. Yeah, they were born that way. No, they weren't born that way. Well, my mom and dad stays away. You don't inherit. That's not a characteristic you inherit, like blue eyes or brown hair, you know. And so what happens is this. Could it be, is it that you put in a long day or you just, could it be that you're trying to avoid conviction? Like Jonah. Jonah hadn't put in a long day. He'd been sleeping the whole time. What means that to him? What, what do you mean by doing this? Nobody else is sleeping. How can you do this? Again, with Jesus, how could he do it? He was in the will of God. He said, you go across there. I'll meet you there. And he was asleep on the boat. And they walked up. I'm not talking about when he walked on the water. So when he's actually in the boat with them. And he saw that he was asleep on the pillow. Remember the story? The disciples just panicked. That's not the problem Jonah had. Jonah was trying to run away from the Lord, responsibility, and what was right. And one way we tend to do that is just, I so good sleep, I don't want to think about it. Number four, a Christian ought not to sleep while others go to battle. A Christian ought not go to sleep when others go to battle. Turn to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, chapter number 11. You know this story. Let me bring some things out to you here. Second Samuel, back in the Old Testament. Second Samuel, chapter number eleven. Look at verse number two. And it came to pass in the eventide that David rose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house, from uh, uh, walked up, I'm sorry, on the roof of the king's house from the roof and saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to 
Maybe I missed something here. It actually says at an even time. In the evening, David rose from off his bed. And don't do this. Maybe he's working third shift. No, he wasn't working third shift. I want you to notice the words. David had slept all day long, and in the evening he got up. Guess what everybody else in town was doing? The evening was coming to a close. They were getting ready to go to bed and close things down, and David's just waking up. So he looks around. And by the way, this isn't unusual. She wasn't doing anything wrong. He was. In the Middle East and places like that, this, this is where they do a lot of that kind of stuff. Up on the roof where it's cooler. That's what we were in Pakistan. We saw this everywhere. When you're standing up on, not people bathing. When you're standing, 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 <laughs> When you're standing on the roof, we looked over and we're like, yeah, where are those some of the kids that are supposed to be in the, you know, and you could see everybody's roof. Why were they spending time up there? To get any breeze you could. And that's why they did that. And they would spend, they had chairs up there and things to sit on. That's just what they did. So David slept in that day. And David slept too long. David slept too long. Now, we don't think, what's the harm in sleeping? I don't know. I guess we have to ask David. While other men were out battling, their commander in chief was sleeping. All this is a character problem. I mean, it's amazing because David was a man's man. I mean, David was a warrior, he was a poet, he was a singer, he was a musician, he, he could break up, the Bible says in Psalm, he could break a bow of steel with his arms. I mean, this was a man, a balanced man, probably one of the more balanced men you'll ever read about in the Bible. What was he doing? Had a long time. Everybody else was fighting. He was sleeping. He got up at even time. It was evening. Everybody else is coming home to rest, clean up, call the day. David is now waking up. That's your kid. Daddy, let me ask you a question. What are you doing when the rest of the family is out in the battle on Saturday and Sunday? I know we're not getting so ordinary. Bows and swings and get ready to go hunk around. It's a battle. I believe people ought to work hard all day. Work hard physically. It'll help folks go to sleep at night. Worry is a bad thing to go to sleep on. I'm just worn out of mostly that's not going to be good sleep. That's restless sleep. Physically worn out. The Bible told Adam way back in the garden, by the sweat of your brow. I don't think you raise a lot of sweat. No? I'm not talking to you ladies, see? That's not part of the workforce I've not ever intended for you. There's something about physical work that's good for us. That just wears us out when most things wrong and says, I can't walk. Then I need to get some work. Sleep. I believe people ought to work hard. I believe hard physical work will help people who say they cannot sleep at night be able to sleep at night. Now, I have to be honest with you. I've worked so hard before my body hurt so bad I was dead tired couldn't sleep. My body was hurting. But I'll tell you when I did sleep. It's like a rock. I'm out of this. You have to understand, sometimes we foolishly deprive ourselves. Not at the wrong time. Then we try to go to sleep on purpose to avoid convention. Then, if we're not careful also, while other people are out doing the work, guess what we're doing? Sleeping. And it's not good for us. I just can't sleep. I'll bet you follow me around or follow one of these guys around and start doing some work, physical work, physical work, which I can't do. You know, we're like the guys, if we're not careful, like we stand on the corner. We'll work for food. So he's offering a job. It's my back. It's my back. I'd love to work. It's my back. Everybody has back problems. You know why? We sit around too much. We look like little turtles. Then, unless I'm doing this, then you say, but I'm so tired. You weren't physically tired, you were mentally tired. Yeah. You should have went to bed. All the family, all the family should put in a good day's hard physical work. We're talking about these kids. 
I'm thrilled on Sunday morning when I see Brother Celia and Brother Pledger have their boys over here early in the morning. Early in the morning. I walk by, I say, Brother Celia, you look like, but you're not him. You're not him. He's a little short fellow. Is he up there with you? Oh, thanks, Lee. You, you bring Maya in. And so they're up early in the morning over here. He said, boy, that makes for a long day. You ever had those kids that they just want to go sleep at night? I can help you with that. Teenagers, same way. They're so sleepy-eyed and can't stay awake during church service to come something they want to do. Physical, hard work. Help them get a good night's sleep. Number five. So I said, number one, a Christian must not foolishly starve his body for sleep. Number two, a Christian must not be perceived as a sleeper. Number three, a Christian must not sleep to avoid conviction. You don't have the advantage I have. Even some of you, you stare with me with glass, empty eyes. Like you have imaginary toothpicks. There's a teenage girl came up to me. She goes, Preacher, I didn't fall asleep this morning. I first wanted to poke fun at her. And I said, Good for you. I'm glad to hear that. Good. See, you can do it if you want to. Somebody had to tell her what a good thing. You watch some of these people, as soon as they come in here, it's like, Okay, let me get as comfortable as Yeah, this is good. Wrap my coat around the panel. Yeah, yeah. So they come here to go to sleep. If you're not careful, you get upset and you want to say something about it. So, the other thing is, number four, a Christian ought not to sleep while others are in battle. Go to Judges chapter 13. Judges, go backward. If you're in Samuel, go backward. That's for Samuel. Go right up to Judges chapter 13. Here we have the story. A Christian ought not sleep from spiritual defeat. Let him sleep. A Christian, I'm sorry, ought to flee. A Christian ought to flee from spiritual defeat rather than to sleep. In Judges 13 through 16, we have the downfall of the man that said more about him that the Spirit of the Lord came upon than anybody else in the Bible ever. This was, this was quite a guy. From his mother's womb, he was filled with Spirit. He was a separated man from day one. He had a Nazarite vow on his life. There were certain things he wasn't going to do. I don't care if the whole world changed. He wasn't going to. I don't care if his own family said, I'm not changing. This was something that he and his parents and God set up and said, this way has to be. We're talking about a very, very strong man in the Lord. Samson, we should go find out. Samson knew all this was going on. Delilah holds Samson captive to her demands on women. Ladies, you know how he did it? How she did it? You know, how this, you know how this woman did this? She begs, she cries, she pleads, she pressures him. So she, see, you lied to me again. Why won't you tell me where your great strength lies? Why do you keep doing this to me? And each time he gets a little closer. And she just keeps pressuring him. Read the story. She just keeps begging. She keeps whining. She keeps putting pressure on him. And he just keeps, fellas, you better be careful about this. Every once in a while, I don't care. Uh, you know, I love her so much, you can't tell her no. You better not say no. Yeah. It'd be mean if I just like it. We're not doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you loved me. By the way, don't you ever say that to your spouse. Don't you ever say that to your spouse. Yeah. So, what happens? She begs, she does all this. Each time he tells her something, it brings him a little closer to disaster. Look at verse number 19 in chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse number 19. And he, and she made him, what was that word? Sleep. Boy, she got him so comfortable. She patted his head, rubbed his back, whispered sweet nothings in his ear, put, her, put his head on her lap, Said that a boy just go to sleep, honey. It's okay. Maybe he thought it was love. But watch what happened. And she called for a man 
and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and he and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. That's a shame, isn't it? Mighty Samson takes a nap at the request of a deceitful woman, and when he wakes up, when he wakes up out of sleep, his strength is already gone. His strength is gone. Look at verse 20, same chapter, verse 20. And she said, and she's done this over and over again. I think he'd have caught on by now. What a stupid hulk. Philistines upon thee, Samson. Okay, what about it? Philistines upon thee, Samson. Okay, what about it? Philistines be upon thee, Samson. Okay, what about it? And she does it again. And he keeps falling for it. What a knucklehead. What a bruiser. Watch what happens here. And she said, Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he woke up out of sleep and said, I will go out as other. She said, I, I can do this. I, I mean, I do it all the time. I can do it all the time. I don't need to pray. I don't need to be separated. Man, I'm so good at singing. I can sing any time I want to. I'm so good at playing piano. I just get up and do it again. I don't need to pray about it. I'm going to need the Lord for it. It's just playing piano. I don't care if it's finances. I don't care if it's working up in the sound room. Okay, it's my turn. I got this. No prayer. No concern. You know, I'm so good at pushing all the right buttons. Yeah, well, that night you pushed the wrong button, didn't you? You got up and shook yourself and said, just like other times, hey, you messed up. You got on that bus and didn't even ask God to help you. You went out soul one and didn't even ask God to help you. You're facing a situation and said, I've handled things like this before. You never even asked God to help you. And Samson did the same thing. Samson knew what she was after. He knew that. His spiritual power. But he took a nap anyway. Why? Nothing new. I've been through this so many times. That's the problem with going through things so regularly without God involved. We actually think we can do without God. He said, nobody would admit that. But if you didn't pray and consider God asking for help before you did it, that's what you're saying. I just shake myself again. Go with business. So how about you? You know when the world is closing in on your spiritual strength. Not looking for you to say amen, but it's true. You know the fight that's taking place inside you. Yet we continue to act like we're in control. We know what's going on. We'll handle it. The same thing. As before. I've done like before. It's always worked. This is what I did the last time. Well, I went out to the, to the gates of Gaza there and, and just ripped it right out of the ground with the men on top of it and walked right up the hill and threw it over. So, man, what a miracle. You won't find that time where he prayed or that God was with him. He did that like he'd always done. You think the first time you step out of line with God, he'll pray? That's it. I'm done with you. He doesn't do that. Samson had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, and it was obvious to him what Delilah was trying to do. He walked on in. We need to wake up. See, we continue to go on in church like we know what we're doing. We amen at the right times. We know how to hold the book. Why? We, we can flip to our Bible quicker than a preacher can. What's the preacher? What's going on? How come it's not there already? We know. We're pretty professional Christians. We're good at what we do. Samson was, Samson was really good at what he did. Took it down at one day and God went. Number, you need to wake up. Quit being logged to sleep. I'm so tired. So first of all, you're depriving yourself of sleep. Some of you, you're in debt or want to do so much, you think if I just get a tough job. You know, there's only so many hours in a day. If I'm not mistaken, it's like 12. Okay, how little you work, how much you work, it's 12 hours a day. That's what I'm in the day, I said the day, not the night, honey. Come on. Spit out that one down. <laughs> People always want to correct me from out there in La La Land someplace. Number six, a Christian ought not to sleep when he should be praying. If there's the greatest thing most Christians are guilty, it's probably this. Go to Matthew chapter number 26. 
Look at verse number 34, chapter 26, Matthew, verse number 34. You know the story. Jesus finds him asleep. He finds him what? Asleep. Anybody remember what they're supposed to be doing? Two things. Two things. Watch. Watch out. Be careful. And keep praying. So he told them how to do this. They've been told to watch and pray. Jesus knows what will take place in every one of their lives. So when he said watch and pray, he wasn't just saying, oh yeah, the Bible teaches us to watch and pray. Like, whatever. Do you know God can watch the whole universe at the same time? And watch you as an individual. So when he looked at Peter and the disciples, he said, now look, you need to watch and pray. He knew what they were getting ready to face. It's going to be a long, long week for these people. Jesus, most of all, but them also. So Jesus told them, you need to pray that you don't fall into temptation. Well, Peter did. He fell into temptation. He denied the Lord. He cursed. He swore. He said, I don't even know who this man is. One right after the other. I just wonder, remember, when Jesus went to go pray, he prayed three times. I don't know. Peter fell asleep every time. Is it possible that he fell asleep those three times and therefore he gave in to sin those three times? Three different times. He swore, denied the Lord, and cussed him right away. Three times. And how many times he fell asleep instead of praying? Three times. You wonder sometimes why you face some things. God, what is going on? Instead of just talking in the air, God. Did you go to your closet? Did you go to your closet? It's not like we're just going to hear your closet. It is any place that God said, so you're in here just for me. God shall see you in your closet. Not hear you, see you. It's our place, right? This is where me and you meet together. Because I see you there. Peter how special this was. The rest of the disciples stay here. It took Peter, James, and John, and they went a little further. That's where he fell asleep. Jesus went a stone's throw farther than that, but he didn't kneel down by a rock and fold his hands, and she kind of glory went around him. I said he fell on his face. Sweat became as it were great drops of blood. He's in constant prayer. He's got to get a hold of the Father for the week he's getting ready to face and he told the disciples to do the same thing. The disciples were supposed to be praying before the battle. Imagine what would happen instead of panic prayers in battle. We would pray before the battle got here. You know, we don't always know what's coming, but a lot of times we get heads up. Constant argument in the home. Hello. Kids keep as teenagers talking back and you catch them doing all kinds of stuff. Battle's coming. Battle's coming. We got more quiet on that. Battle's coming. The temptation to stay home and you're doing it more regular. Battle's coming. Well, it's not that bad yet. Like Santa, we'll get up and shake ourselves. Like Sunday morning, we'll just go to church. There's a battle coming. They were praying. Many Christians are the same. When the battle comes, it's easier to sleep than face it. And it is. I love my bed. So we do too. Spend a lot of time there. I really do. We got this mattress company like three foot deep, but you don't sink. If you did, you smother. But we don't do. It's very comfortable. And if I can find myself, I can find myself. So anyway, I sleep. Do you know why they make alarms? Brasilia didn't know. You make one time. That forever. He said, Preach outside my alarm may go off. I said, Don't tell me that. Alarm, you said an alarm go off. Actually, it was his wife that woke him up. Honey, aren't you supposed to be at work? Well, that was how I miss it. Why didn't that? A stupid alarm. Do you ever notice how stupid those alarms are? Those alarms just will not go off. I said them and they just will not go off. Not true. Now, I'll tell you how to build character. I heard this from Brother Hiles himself. Not lately, because he's in heaven. He was so worried about going someplace and missing the appointment that he was supposed to be preaching at. 
he took back in the day, you know, they'll wind up in the closet. He took three of them. That's what he did. You know, he takes three. I got one. What if it didn't work? He said, I called down to the desk. You know how many of those incompetent people forget to call you? Evidently, evidently you don't do much traveling. Uh, like, yeah, oh, man, I forgot to call. Like, okay, are you like up now, huh? Yeah, like now I am. I'll be down to shoot you in a minute. He said the second one was in case the first one didn't work. And the third one was to make sure I really got up. You know what that was? That was a man that said, I will not be caught this way. So on purpose, he did a very, very right thing. So people go like, yes, he's never late. He's always here. He's never missing an appointment. And, and you can, how do I do this all the time? I'm always missing. I'm always late. I, I fail to remember that. How could he do that and we don't do that? Because he on purpose said things and remind himself. We all read about what happened to the disciples. The Bible said, the Lord, the Lord said to Peter, Peter, the devil himself desire to sift you as wheat. What do you say next? But I, I pray for you. The Lord said, but I pray for you. Jesus Christ, God Almighty, in human form, said, Peter, I prayed for you. Peter, I prayed for you. And by the way, I even know this, that when you're converted, after your back's fighting, you get back where you're supposed to be. So what he was telling him, it's, it's going to happen, but I pray for you. Peter, if you can believe this, I'll die for you before I'll deny you. He wouldn't listen to the word of God. Jesus said, for the night's over with you, I will not. You might as well read the Bible, guys. I don't believe that. Peter, Jesus just told you, you know, God Almighty, the one you said, thou hast the words of life. You remember that part? Yeah, Peter, come on, wake up, wake up. You remember that? Yeah. He said you're going to deny. I don't believe that. I know my own. Do you? You know your own heart? Peter denied. Perhaps Peter, as I said before, committed a sin for every time he was asleep. Number one, a Christian must not fall asleep, starve his body. Sometimes you have to push. That's all there is to it. Every teenager, you're like, I'm not starving my body. I'm going to be a blood most like. Number two, a Christian must not be perceived as a sleeper. I will go there, but he's probably still sleeping. I normally sleep in on Monday. I normally about eight o'clock. That would be my sleeping hour. I will be. I'm 71. Is that I'm doing good? Okay. It's not my age she cares about. It's if I'm 72, then she's a male whore. Number three, a Christian must not sleep till the day of conviction. I used to tell people all the time, I think it's a sin to sleep while preaching is going on. Can I get this right? God's man preaching God's book to God's people, and you're snoring. You need some sleep. And you also need some mental discipline. When I was in college, uh, Dr. Porter, do you remember his first name? What, is, what a partner. He used to tell, because you got these high school kids, I'm 35, 36 years old, going to college, four kids, two dogs, and a I'm working a piecework job and laying carpet on the side while I'm almost full time at a local church. So I had a few things going on. To be honest with you, I sat in class and stared. No eyes on one close and the other one's looking at eyes. Look up, look up, look up. Don't fall asleep, look up. He made this statement one day. He said, I have more respect for those of you that would get up because you're afraid you're going to fall asleep. Stand in the back and listen. Than to fall asleep at your desk. Yeah. Guess what a lot of them did anyway? They fell right asleep at your desk. They're not listening. 
You say, I'm just one of those people that get a lot of sleep. No, you're not. You're one of those people that have learned to sleep a lot. Yeah. Well, that was good. Did anybody write that down? Yeah. Yeah. See, I just rolled off the top. I don't want to come to now. Number five. A Christian ought to flee from spiritual defeat rather than sleep through it. You're going to be all right. Oh, yeah, that's getting bad. I'd be all right. Number six. A Christian ought not to sleep, but he should be praying. Number seven, go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Only have 40 minutes. I see you like you to pray. Here's that not true, right? You get ready quick. I've had a bowl cereal today. How about you? That's all I did. You won't believe this. You actually do not have to eat constantly all day. Isn't that weird? Well, I'm just one of those people. No, you're not. You have become one of those people. <laughs> yes, sir. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse number 7 to 11. Twenty, verse number seven. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached. Okay, preaching service. Ready to depart on the morrow, he continued his speech until midnight. Whoa! Midnight service. And there were many lights in the upper chamber. By the way, we were in an upper room. Yes, wasn't it weird? It was, as soon as we started up, I went, this is how I took my bread. We left a service down here in a house. At a midnight or three in the morning. We turn the corner, and their stairs do not sometimes have the whole side to miss it. No handrail, no nothing. And they said, we're going to go up there to eat. Like the last supper, I think. It was, it, was, it was surreal. It really was. And so we went up there, and they were sitting on the floor. They had this huge bed. They were sitting over there. We had the chairs, and they had tables that were only about that high. And food and dishes. They, they just go, here, here, put it down. I know you're like this bread. I'll sit on your plate. I'm like, oh, I'm hungry. <laughs> Watch what happens here. So, verse number nine. And they're set in a window. Bad mistake. Preachers preaching all night. You're sitting in an open window. Just think about that for a moment. A certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen asleep into a deep sleep, he fell asleep. Listen to Paul preach. Being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, there's nothing wrong with this. It happens. They didn't say it's Paul's fault for preaching. They said it was his fault for sleeping in an open window. Watch what happened. He sunk down, talking, not Paul, but the, the kid, to sleep and fell down from the third law, three stories up. The kid sat in a three-story window, one leg outside, swinging back and forth. Like, oh. And he falls asleep during the preaching. I love this story. And the pilot said, and the fact that from the third loft, and was taken up dead. So I think his kid died. Can you imagine the papers? Preacher preaches until they're dying over there. Take them out of I didn't do it. And Paul went down and fell on him, embraced him, trouble not yourselves for his life. He said, I don't know if Paul brought it back to my friends. This young man slept during preaching, fell from the balcony three stories up. That's a cute story, preacher. That kind of stuff that happened today. That may very well be true. However, the Bible promises the length of days will be shortened for the person who does not listen to the man of God preach the word of God. They get to see it carefully. God's very serious about his local church, about his preacher, and about the word of God. Very, very important. So just take off when you want, sleep in when you want, don't study when you want, and don't listen to me if you don't want. You probably want to 
worse thing. That's why God can help us. Hey, wake up. I'm talking to you. Tiny, okay? I'm not doing it to be mean or hurt your parents. Well, you should have turned him down to work. Proverbs chapter 4. Keep your hand in and come back. Proverbs chapter 4. See, we're Bible believers. So when God makes a hint to something, we make an excuse about that something. For the sake not just somebody's you know, I got work. Man, I'll always be praying. You know, I'm just tired. Kid fell out of the third story because he fell asleep listening to preaching. You know, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to have to work and I'm just worn out. David slept all day on like, David. Come on, you know better than this. Samson, what are you doing? You put your head down to go to sleep in the lap of a woman who's been trying to get your head taken off. Can I get in the end? Okay. What's going to happen to you? In uh, Proverbs chapter number four. Proverbs chapter number. Did I say four? Look at verse number seven. Proverbs chapter four. Oh, 20. I'm sorry. Proverbs 20. Proverbs 4, verse number 20. There. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. And the reason why I'm for are because they're life. They're life. Unto those that find them. And health to all their flesh. To their flesh. You get that part? Health to their flesh. You know when spiritually you're strong, even in bad health times, you have more strength. You just feel better. How many of you have told me, you told me yourself, and I've heard hundreds of people over the decades of time, you're doing okay? Because I'm doing okay, but my body is worn out. You ever seen somebody laugh? And tears are coming out of their face. You ever see somebody be full of hope when it seems like they've lost almost everything they've got? Do you know what that is? That right there. They actually don't just listen and take good notes. They buy into it. They say, God said it, so I, 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 I do that right there. You have to understand these kinds of things. This young man slept and he fell out. What you need to do, you ready? Quit getting comfortable in church service. Sit up. Bad posture, baby. You go like this when you get old. That whole turtle thing. You don't do that. You go wearing glasses, you look like a little turtle or a Jimmy Cricket or whatever. Tortoise in the air, and you're walking along. Right? So that's why you have this now. <laughs> Extra skin so you can shake it You need to listen on purpose. Quit letting your mind drift. You don't fix that problem. You don't want that job comes up. Oh, I don't want to get up and work anything, but no. Discipline. Discipline. Learn to make a character. I am going to listen. Here's what I used to do all the time. Even when I first got saved, I call it preaching along with the preacher. That doesn't mean you argue with me while we're preaching. He said that, but here's what I was saying. No. It's like this. He's going to use this first. I know he's I knew, it. I knew, I knew where he was going. He started off with this, and he's trying. He does that. He's trying to make the hydrogen bomb. What you got no hydrogen bomb? What are you talking about? He's just pulling in, and then he turns the page. You know, what would happen if you not been paying attention? You have to understand. God writes the Bible so that you have to pay attention. God wants you to spend time with him. God said, now walk with me. How could two walk together lest they be agreed? So let me help you that I may know him in the fellowship of his suffering. You're never going to get to know Jesus till you walk with him long enough to suffer with him. And you say, I think I know what God meant by that. Why? They never done that. So you have to understand, sit up and listen on purpose. Participate. Learn how to tell Why don't you amen anymore? Well, I just, physically, I don't feel like it. I'm sorry, that's not the way it works. You amen because it's right and it's true. 
You tell your flesh, you're going to do what I want you to do. I'm not doing what you want me to do. I'll be preaching on that Sunday morning. Not just about amen, but you want to be here for that. You need to pray. You need to participate. You know, stay away. First, I've got to say, all of my brother's friends and people that I knew, they were all preachers. And they were wonderful, bro. And when they got up to preach, everybody's like, yes. Come on. Come on, yeah. Huh? That's right. Yeah, yeah. And when, then what did he do? See? And that, 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 it's like saying, sick him to a dog. You understand? Sick him to a dog. Sick him. You understand? See, you're like this. Unbelievable. Why didn't you amen? You might be suffering with the Lord. Number seven, I'm done. Go to Daniel chapter number six. You know Daniel? Daniel. The past children, Joel, Hosea, Daniel. Last one would be this one. You will not sleep well when you have made unwise decisions. The worst thing you can do in a panic situation is to, whenever you're pressured to make a decision, what should you do? Wait. Don't make the decision right now. No matter how you're pregnant, just keep going. You say, what's it say that about me? It's a principle. I'm getting ready to show you a principle of somebody who made a hasty decision and regretted it. What's what happens here? And Daniel, I said number seven, this is number eight, whatever, next number. You will not sleep well when you've made unwise decisions. In Daniel chapter six, excuse me, verse number 18, then the king, you know the story, the king, uh, Daniel got set up, right? Uh, all the people, all the political people were jealous of him, like everybody in the front. And uh, they were all jealous, <laughs> same situation. And uh, so they said, uh, hey, King, you know how much we love you, Joe Biden, uh, King, and uh, if, if you'll pass this bill and pass that bill, you, you'd be like God, Joe Biden said. I think I know what that means, I'm not sure. And uh, so they passed this bill, and the bill was this. Nobody could pray to any God. Now, that's all about Joe Biden, you know. Okay, back to reality. And they said, yes, okay. So what they were doing, they could care less about the king necessarily. They wanted to get Daniel in trouble. So right after that, they sat over and watched Daniel. Everything he did. Let me see. I want to listen to him. No, that, you know, he's keeping that one. No, he's keeping that one. Now, let's see. We're not going to catch him on laws concerning our land or our government. We're going to have to catch him on laws concerning his government. Because you see, good Christians are very predictable. Oh, well, I wonder what they're going to do now. That's not a good Christian. Good Christians are very predictable. How did they know that Daniel was going to go to his house? David, how Daniel was going to go to his house, kneel down with his window open, and pray three times a day? How did they know that? They know where he was. How did Judas know where Jesus and the disciples were praying that night? Anytime they're in that area, that's where they go. It's like clockwork. Do it all the time. So they set Daniel up, and they run over to the king. You know the whole story? They run over to the king and ratted on him. You know what I'm talking about? Now, the difference between ratting on somebody and purposely trying to get them in trouble, as opposed to telling on someone to help stop them from being in trouble. Can't believe how many of you don't say, I can't ratted on my friend. What are you, kindergarten still? What are you? So, what's it happened? Verse 18. Then the king went to his palace. Now, he passed the bill. Daniel's going to go into the lion's den. It's over with. I can't. And here's what he says. I don't believe this. How could I have fallen for this? He got set up. But to keep his word, because, you see, they thought kings were gods. But God's never made a mistake. Come like us. So, he said to himself, the king, oh, king, you know me. Once a law is passed, it never needs to be changed because you're like, God, oh, you know, what we're going to do. So with sorrow, he takes Daniel, goes in line there. What did, so he hurried and listened to the wrong people, made a snap decision, and what did the king do? Now look at verse number 18. Back there again. Then the king went up to his palace and passed the night fasting. 
neither were instruments of music. This would teach you how things that would calm you down. Brought before the night, watch this, in his sleep went from him. Darius likes him. He likes him. They were kind of like buddies, like or not. He helped the king out a lot. But what are you going to do when you're basically God? You made a statement and you've got to kill him, right? All that night he fasted, he prayed, he worried, he couldn't wait till the morning. Just in the hopes that his God would save Tammy. But you see what happened because of the snap decision. All that night he couldn't sleep because he made a bad decision. Boy, if he had just had some sleeping pills, huh, that would help. That's what I do when I'm having trouble sleeping. I just had a handful of sleeping pills. Yeah. We have a lot of unbiblical answers for things that are trying to get our attention from. Yeah. Yeah. Now we're so worn out because we're slept so still because of all the pharmaceutical junk that's inside of us. I need to feel good. Wait a minute. Man, I'm so tired. I don't want to do I'll give you a five-hour energy drink. Four of them. Yeah. Man, I'm wired now. Boy, oh, boy. It'll be a great day. I'm wide awake. The king didn't have me do it. And actually, he said, I want to eat it. I'm not going to eat. I'm not getting comfortable tonight. And his sleep left him that night. You understand sometimes, the rice was... Talking was talked into making some very hasty, unwise decisions. When he made that decision, he did not realize who all was going to get hurt because he made a snap decision. We do it all the time. Well, no, I think this will be good for me. What about the rest of your family? What about your family? What about the church? What about the cause of Christ? The king who didn't have to apologize or answer anybody. Sleep at night because he made a snap decision. He was up all night and could not sleep because of an unwise decision. A guilty conscience will rob you of sleep. Don't fool yourself. Fighting back and forth in your mind. Your flesh trying to capture what Sam Robin capture your mind and bring it into subjection of the sin of the flesh. When the spirits say, No, just tell God, repent, get right. Let's go look back. What do you think you're losing sleep in your head for? What do you think that's all about? God is trying to say, no time to go to sleep. We need to wake up and do some things right. You made some bad decisions. You made some bad choices. And we need to get this thing figured out here. Before you possibly, before you do that, a guilty conscience will rob you of sleep. Before you possibly lose sleep and possibly hurt others that you love, why not seek good counsel? But he didn't. He then went to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, I was going to ask you to do something. All these presidents and all these guys running the country over here, they're really pushing you. Do you see any problem with that? I know what they were saying. You know, I'll tell you what they were saying. Daniel, you know that guy didn't get like a whole lot of that Daniel. They're trying to set him up. They don't, they don't like him. They don't have like to put a heap of on top of your window. They don't like that. So that's what this is all about. See, he wouldn't, he wouldn't stop long enough talking. Look, I'm not God. I don't have a crystal ball. I have a crystal ball, but I don't have a crystal ball. I like boots. But what is wrong with you simply saying, hey, preacher, can I ask you a question? No, you went ahead and bought it. You went ahead and did it. You went ahead and sold it. You went ahead and moved it. You went ahead. You went ahead. You went ahead. And then you went like this. Yeah. I'm going to think something else we have to do. I'm here, man. I, most of the time I go like this. Sound good to me. Somebody recently asked me, said, Preacher, thinking about buying this, what do you think about it? My first thought was, first of all, is the person's character. Second of all, was their financial abilities. Third thing was how they take care of their family and serve the Lord. You know what I said? Sounds okay to me. Why did I even ask him? You're showing God I will follow your procedures, and God will bless you for that. I'm not the answer man. Not close. I'm not the answer man. So what happens here? You make you make a move without prayer and counsel. You purchase something without considering the family. Fellas, you, you're, you're famous for doing that stuff. 
and then to make up the excuse, hey, I'm mad at Sammy, I know what I'm doing. And yeah, but she handles the check with the pay all the bills. But you just call them and tell them. We'll get back to you. Oh, is that a better idea? Sir, why don't you call and tell them? Oh, she's good at it. She's good at begging. She's good at making stuff up. Because of you. Change jobs only thinking of yourself. Sounds good. Sleep. Oh. Sleeping for the wrong reasons is a bad thing. I don't know who told you might to take off running and fall asleep in the middle of the desert. But an angel came by and said, you need to eat this and sleep. So much, you just keep pushing, pushing, pushing. I know, I have a couple of you. As soon as you sit down, your eyes go to sleep. I think you love me. But I prefer to think that. I think you like this place. I think you like what's going on. The problem is you're not character. The character that says, I'm getting ready to go to church, I've got to stay awake. Once you fall asleep, fall asleep, fall asleep, fall asleep, fall asleep. is, how do you build character? It is the purposeful doing of something. How do you become a junkie? Well, you just look at drugs and become a junkie. That's not how it works. How do you learn how to smoke? Nobody starts and goes, man, this is great. No, they went, <laughs> and they overrode their conscience and worked at it and worked at it to be cool, to fit in. And pretty soon now you can't stop. You built that character. You built that character. You built that part of your character. Then you can build other parts of your character if you follow God. But it is the purposeful doing when it comes to Christian character, the purposeful doing of what is right, regardless of what my flesh tells me it wants to do or doesn't want to do. And my flesh tells me almost every morning I'm sick. That's my flesh tells me. I want you to feel your flesh part tells you, let's get up and exercise. I said, I don't know how to spell exercise. I ain't going to do any exercise. We're going to sleep in. Then the stupid phone by my bed goes off. I have, I don't know really what I did. I reached over and said, I didn't go off 10 minutes early. Because there's that my 10 minutes is an hour 10 minutes early. I pushed snooze. Yeah, Miss Carter. Bad idea. I saw you go again. Now I have to rush. That's when all those school buses get in front of me. Yeah. Insult to injury now. And then some old lady wants to turn on her lights, right? Emergency flashers because it's starting to rain. Go figure. Once you slow down around the curves to 12 miles an hour. 12. 12 miles an hour. 12. Is anybody listening to me? Is this on? Am I the only person that's infuriated by stuff like that? Now my wife says, honey, that could be my dad. No, honey, your dad's in heaven. He's fine. <laughs> Twelve. So I, I look down and go, I don't believe this. Twelve miles an hour. I'll guarantee you it is a foreigner. Guarantee. Or some old grandma. You can always tell they drive with two hands. Just like they instruct you to at driver school. You only do that for driver school, knucklehead. Nobody drives like that. Slow down. 